Here in mid-spring, anglers could encounter anything from crystal clear water to chocolate milk. But how do we address each of those scenarios? We're going to talk about just that on this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast. I'm Chad Lachance, and you're listening to Fishful Thinker, the podcast. All things fishful, all the time. Hey guys, Chad Lachance here. Appreciate you tuning in to this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast, which, like all the rest of our content, is brought to you by the fine folks at Sportsman's Warehouse. Visit them at sportsmans.com or at a brick and mortar near you, more than 132 locations nationwide. Check them out. They've been with us since day one. Uh, guys, happy to have you guys joining us right now because it's getting to be that time of year where we're getting in the boat a bunch finally, and um, the weather's broken. It's push, supposed to be close to 80 degrees here today. And what that means in northern Colorado is muddy water. And it may be muddy water in reservoirs. It may be muddy water from, from runoff in some of the small lakes around town. And it may be the river themselves. Uh, but muddy water is going to be a potential issue. Uh, it's not a problem. It doesn't have to be a problem. You can make it a problem in your brain, but at the end of the day, muddy water is more of a problem for the anglers than the fish, and you could encounter some really fantastic fishing in conditions you really don't expect. Now, to be honest with you, uh, water clarity is one of those things that I think messes with people a lot, and Really clear water sometimes messes with people's, uh, and when I say messes with people, I mean it messes with your psyche, it messes with your confidence. I've seen guys completely panic and fall apart in crystal clear water. I've seen guys completely panic and fall apart in really muddy water. And it really just depends on what your life experience has been in terms of angling in those situations. Now, it's interesting because really the the muddy water versus clear water situation is really not any different than fishing in the light and the dark. And if you're comfortable fishing in the dark, you should be comfortable fishing in muddy water. And some of the scenarios and some of the ways we address them is exactly the same. And so we're going to go through some of that here on our way through. Now, before I get too far into this, my home lake, Horsetooth Reservoir, you can encounter all of the above uh, right this minute on any given outing. You can go out and be out in the middle of the main lake or, or some of the main lake shorelines and the water is absolutely crystal clear. I mean, 15 plus feet of visibility, uh, just absolutely clear water. And that will definitely mess with some people. Conversely, you can get in some of the areas on the flatter banks that are, that are more mudline banks because the lake is rising and you can get straight chocolate milk water where there's no visibility. You can take a, a you know, basically just take stock in the fact that nothing can be seen in the water. There's no light penetration, no nothing. And that's a, a big deal. You can also find the water colors everywhere in between as, of course, they mix. And that's kind of a, a scenario where you can go find the sweet spot for your own confidence if you have one. So the first thing I'm going to say is if, hey, I am way more confident fishing in clear water well, then go seek that out wherever it is you fish if it's available to you. If you're more confident in mud, go seek that out because neither scenario is automatically better than the other one for catching fish. What is good for catching fish is your confidence. And if you're not confident in crystal clear water or muddy water, as the case might be, then you need to find other water to increase your chances, if at all possible. And anyone that's ever been to a bass fishing tournament, a pro-level bass fishing tournament or walleye fishing tournament, You'll see some guys will make big, giant runs in their boats, go long ways, you know, 50 miles or more. And it's because they're looking for a water color they like in a lot of scenarios. Sometimes they're looking for temperature. Sometimes they're just looking for water clarity that they like. But uh, it's, it's it's such a strong indicator of people or such a strong indicator to people, I should say, of what their strengths are and are not. Uh, when it comes to fishing. And I've seen some pro bass guys that will go to great lengths to find muddy water, shallow water specialists that really want to find some muddy water. And I've seen other guys, particularly Western anglers, that are immediately out looking for the clearest water they can find. So again, there's no right or wrong answers. It really depends on how you address each of those 
you know, water clarities as you as you find them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And here in the West, it might even be that the water, particularly if you're fishing rivers, is really clear in the morning because it's cold overnight and there's no snow melt. And then by, you know, midday, it's muddy. And by three in the afternoon, you can't see in it at all. And so that's a very real scenario that happens pretty much every day for the next six weeks in a lot of the areas around my home uh, up in the rivers. So those rivers then subsequently come down and drain into lakes and uh, and ponds and do the same thing to the ponds. So you may find out that the pond in the morning or the lake in the morning is really clear and not the other way around uh, in the afternoon. It's all muddy. Um, some of the reservoirs in my home state where major rivers feed them, for instance, Pueblo Reservoir, where the Arkansas River runs into one end of it, uh, the dam end of the lake will be really clear. The upper end of the lake where the river is be really muddy. So again, you can go find what you want. It's just a matter of what do you want. Or conversely, let's say you can't go find what you want. Let's say that you're stuck in the muddy water or you're stuck in the clear water. How do we address those scenarios? So that's what we're going to, that's kind of the meat of where we're going to go here today. And so let's dive right into that. Let's start off with uh, the scenarios for really clear water, because to be honest, for me, I'd rather have muddy water um, because really clear water give fish a chance to observe a lot of stuff. It increases light penetration in the water. So sun is going down into the water a long ways or light of any kind is going into the water a long ways when you have really clear water. So that has a tendency to push fish deeper so now automatically, the deeper fish are, in a lot of ways, the harder they are to catch, the harder it is to be in control of this scenario. So crystal clear water is what I would rather not have. And it starts with the light penetration and the depth that it generates or pushes fish to. The second scenario is it gives them a chance to see everything that you as an angler are doing. And I mean, as in see your boat, see your shadow, see your silhouette, see motion, color, fish see in color, obviously. We've all dealt with lures. Uh, see the color of your jacket above the water. The one saving grace is that because the water's clear, if there is any sunlight, the fish tend to pull a little bit deeper. The deeper they are, the narrower their sight picture is out the top of the water. So, if, you're, if you've got shallow water and it's really clear and there's fish in it, it's very difficult to hide from those fish because the window that they have to the world above water is much bigger uh, when they're shallower just based on the angles of how, how their eyes work and, and light refraction. So really clear water with, with in fish that are shallow is a problem for sure for an angler because you need to be extremely sneaky in that scenario. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing about really clear water is it gives the fish a really good chance to observe your lure, observe your bait, um, like very closely observe your lure or bait. And that gives them a chance to see holes in your presentation very easily, whether you're drifting a dry fly and he gets all kinds of time to see it coming and study it and maybe cruise along underneath it for a minute before he refuses it and breaks your heart all the way to, you know, fish that, that, you can't sneak up on with your lure, let's say. So you could have a bass sitting, you know, on deep rock and he, your, he knows your lure's coming from a mile away because he can see it. So it becomes much more difficult to be sneaky in crystal clear water. That's one of the reasons I don't like it. Uh, but how I will address clear water is a, a multi-pronged approach because, again, we don't always have the option to choose exactly what we want. Some scenarios we do, and my first choice is to run somewhere else on the, on the lake and find, clear, or find uh, more stain to the water. But if I can't do that and I'm stuck with crystal clear water, then here's how I'll address that. Um, first and foremost... Uh, all my baits get downsized. Everything gets downsized in crystal clear water because they have such a good chance to look at your stuff <clears throat> that they don't need the size. In a lot of cases, you can use size to your advantage, but in crystal clear water, I think it's big lures are a great way to get follows, but not a great way to get bites. Anyone that's ever done a whole bunch of swim baiting will know that. You throw a big old swim bait around, you, if you can see it coming, it's common to see fish following it, but they're just curious about it. They're not necessarily going to bite it. So the first thing I will do is downsize everything. 
uh, across the board in terms of its profile uh, or its silhouette. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Now, whenever I downsize my lures, what has to happen next? We preach this all the time. First you choose your lure, then you choose your line, then you choose your rod, then you choose your reel. Well, if I'm going to downsize my lures, stands to reason I'm also going to downsize my line. So it may just be, depending on the scenario, that I'll downsize only the leader. So a lot of the baits that I throw are going to be braided with a leader, a uh, braided line of some sort with a leader on it. In that scenario, the braid won't change, but the leader will <clears throat> so that I can get a more natural presentation out of it. That's one scenario that I'll, I'll do. Uh, another one is if I'm using straight monofilament or fluorocarbon, then I'll downsize the whole thing because I have no leader involved. So let's say that I normally present a full-size jerkbait on, you know, uh, say 12 to 15 pound fluorocarbon leader, maybe 10. Well, in crystal clear water, I'm going to downsize that jerkbait for starters quite a bit. And second of all, that I'm going to take my leader down to maybe 8 or 10 on the outside instead of 10 to 15 on the outside. So it's a little bit lighter scenario, and that's so that, A, the, the bait can behave more naturally, which we need it to do, if, if at all possible, in crystal clear water. And for two, so the visibility of the line is harder for fish to notice. So... That's the second thing I'll do. I'll downsize the lure, downsize the line. Then the downsized lure is also going to get sped up significantly in most scenarios. Um, so let's say I would work a mid-speed retrieve with a crankbait or a jerkbait or whatever it is that I'm winding. I will then take that to a full-speed retrieve in clear water, and it goes comes to the fact that I kind of want to sneak up on my fish. And so... Uh, the faster the lures go and the better chance you have of getting fish to commit to it and just grabbing it on impulse as it comes by or for by the time they realize it's there in their realm and all. In other words, their lateral line has sensed it. They feel the vibration. They feel it coming even before they've seen it. By the time, if it's going real fast, it gets to them quicker and you get, have a better chance of... of of getting them to just pounce. And that's really what you need to do in a lot of scenarios. Uh, everyone talks about reaction bites. So I had a long talk with, with Larry Dahlberg. Um, and Larry Dahlberg, one of the most famous anglers of all time. Well, any bite is a reaction to your lure. Anything a fish does is a reaction. So he likes to call them impulse bites. They bite out of impulse. Kind of like if you're not looking at me and I lob a ball to you and you catch it out of the corner of your eye, you're just going to grab it. You're going to see it out of the corner of your eye, you just grab it out of instinct. Same thing with a fish. So a really fast lure that comes into their peripheral vision is a good thing to get them to pounce on. And that's more so in crystal clear water. Another thing besides pure speed that I might do is extreme erraticness. And this one I really like in clear water because um, it's just a great way to, to generate that impulse. So if it's a jerk bait, it's going to be really erratic. If it's a tube jig, instead of doing a lift and drop, I'm going to do a snap and drop where I snap it up hard and let it go back down to the bottom. I mentioned that I downsized the profile of the bait. I might take that same two and a half inch tube jig, which is already a downsized profile, but I'll put a heavier lead head in it, which doesn't change the size, physical size of the bait, but does change the fall rate ex a whole bunch. And so instead of having maybe an eighth ounce jig in that two and a half inch tube, maybe I'll go to a three eighths ounce jig head in there. And then when I snap that bait up and kill it, it goes back to the bottom in a hurry. And again, I'm just trying to make the bait very reactive for the clear water scenario. Uh, so speed or erraticness, um, those two things work together can be fantastic uh, in, in really, really clear water. Uh, another thing that, that can be really good in clear water or is, is something you're going to see me do always in clear water is going to be either I'm going to have a very, very shiny bait, whether it be chrome or gold chrome, uh, something like that, something that is truly reflective. I'm not talking about a hot color here. I'm talking about shiny, so we'll pick up sun and give you the strobe effect or the mirror effect, like a signal mirror. Uh, that will be my first color choice, and the reason being is it has the most drawing power. So the strobe will get the fish's attention, but because the bait is mirrored, when it's just sitting in the water column, it doesn't give off as big of a profile as if it was a solid color. So 
that's my first choice. And it will, fish will notice it from a long ways away with the strobe effect. And again, with the downsized profile and the speed, um, the, the bait disappears when the strobe goes away. If it was a solid color, it wouldn't. So the strobe, they notice it from way out there, but then it's gone. And that's a key thing. If it was a solid white bait, they'd see it way out there and then they'd continually be able to see it all the way back to them. And the, the mirrored bait, the pure chrome baits, uh, will do a great job of basically making themselves extremely obvious and extremely unobvious, uh, if that's a real word, uh, in crystal clear water. So that's the first thing I'm going to go to. And in some scenarios, you'll get the, where that'll put fish off. They'll bum rush the bait and then not get it. It's too much. Uh, the strobe effect is too much for the mood or mindset of the fish. Classic example of that might be a post-cold front day here in spring where the sun comes out, the wind lays down, the crystal clear water, and the fish are put off because the water temperature cooled off a little bit. Then I'm probably not going to get a lot of bites with the mirror or the strobe effect at that scenario. As soon as I've determined that, then the other spectrum of color comes into play, and that is translucent, a bait that is as clear as I can get. Uh, I love translucent baits because they displace water so fish can feel it, but they have a hard time tracking it with their eyes because it's trans translucent. It's very natural looking, uh, a great way to get bites. So when the water's really clear, I'm either on the shiniest bait I can get or the clearest bait I can get. Those are the two spectrums, and it's very easy for me to get in a box and decide which bait I'm gonna choose based on my prevailing conditions from there. Now, the last thing I'll throw out there about, or last couple things about crystal clear water, and one I already alluded to, and that is you need to keep your boat length longer casts. I'm not generally a, a fan of longer casts. The shortest casts I can get away with will catch me the most fish because I have the most control and hook set ability and all of that. But when the water's real clear, you may need to make some long bombs to get fish away, to keep your lures away from your boat. Just even if you're on the bank, you may need to make long throws down the bank ahead of you uh, or something like that, uh, again, to keep your silhouette or your profile or your visuals of whatever it is away from the fish. So it's, I am an advocate of that uh, scenario is the long casting a lot of times. And if you are going to sit in one spot, I want my boat to be anchored, physically anchored for as long as I can. If I'm going to, to sit and fish one area, let the fish relax about the boat being there because they can read every scratch on the bottom of that hull. They know you've got a Hamby's keel guard on the bottom of your bass boat at that scenario when the water's real clear. So uh, park the boat, let it sit there for a while if you can, particularly if you're fishing a little bit deeper and they will quickly become accustomed to your boat. The one good thing about fish is they have little brains. So they'll quickly become accustomed to your boat being there if nothing negative is going on and then you can fish around it. So I would I would advocate that. And then the last thing I'll throw out there, and this one is, is only for certain species, but I think it works well when it does, and that is to fish on the surface, not just under the surface, right on the surface, the surface bait. This works fantastic for everything from bass to pike to trout to white bass. When the water is very clear, surface commotion can be your friend. And a buzz bait that's really fast with a minimal skirt and a shiny blade is a good call. A pure chrome walking bait or a clear walking bait like a jaywalker or something, a Zara Spook style bait, uh, again, can be a great call. Could be in clear, could be in chrome, uh, anything like that. Uh, again, but not a solid color. But it's just something that displaces a lot of water and uh, on the surface and makes a, a V-wake of some sort. The V-wakes are a known attractor, very, very good call. So let's go to the other end of the spectrum. And I'm not guys going to talk a whole bunch about the midwater colors because that's what we fish most of the time. And I think by the end of this podcast, you'll understand if where I'm going with the clear water and where I'm going with the stained water. And therefore, uh, you'll have some idea where I land in the middle, which is the rest of the time for the water. So hopefully it'll help. So we've addressed clear water. We, we need to make smaller baits. They need to be faster. They need to be on lighter line. They need to be either really shiny or really clear. And you need to be really sneaky, potentially make longer throws and surface commotion can be your friend. When it comes to talking about muddy water, 
the easy answer right here in the next five minutes is re the, the inverse of everything I just told you. So I have a tendency when I get around really muddy water to fish larger than average baits right off the bat. And the reason being is I want to displace as much water as possible such that fish can find my lure easier with their lateral line. Uh, the other thing is the splash of the bait hitting down will help fish uh, locate a bait in the in the in the uh, bigger water. The bigger profile will give them a, a better visual if they can see. If it gets close enough to where they can see it at all, they can get a visual on it. If it's got a bigger profile, and so that's a key thing, um, you know, for the muddy water scenario. So a bigger bait. The the next thing I'll do in a muddy water scenario is make sure that my baits have a significant amount of rhythmic vibration to them. So when I say rhythmic vibration, I mentioned in clear water that I want something erratic. I want just the opposite of that in muddy water because I want a fish to be able to use his lateral line to accurately track down where this thing is in the water and then strike it from out being able to see it at close range and rhythmic baits will do that. So something that's got a rhythmic rattle to it or a very rhythmic vibration pattern to it as opposed to fast or erratic uh, where the fish still feel it and still track it down but will have a much harder time getting an accurate bite on the bait. So that's the scenario that I will do as well. I want potentially a rattle in my bait or noise in my bait that is rhythmic as well. Something like a lipless crankbait on a nice, even, medium speed retrieve, just winding it along so that the rattles can do what they do and the fish can track it down. Maybe a quarter of a stutter in the reel handle every now and then just to, to shake the BBs a little bit different, but basically a very rhythmic retrieve uh, any kind of a lipped crankbait with a rattle built in, same kind of thing. It's just going to flop back and forth as you retrieve it. That really rhythmic noise will help fish locate it. When it comes to colors, uh, in muddy water, pure mud, I love a pure black, I love a pure white, and I love a really hot uh, chartreuse or orange or some combo thereof, potentially red. But really, black or white does most of my heavy lifting in in very, very stained, heavy, heavily muddied up water because either of them will pop very well in the water as far as visuals go. Um, both are proven colors in general, and muddy water can make fish a little bit a little bit trickier to catch in general. So the last thing I want to be doing is messing with experimental colors. So I'm going to go with blacks and whites and maybe, particularly if there's a salmonid or a trout involved of some sort, then I might go to a hot, really hot orange. Uh, if there's walleyes uh, or, or even smallmouth around, I might go to really hot chartreuse as well. But the colors will be very powerful uh, one way or the other. And I will skip all the chrome and I will skip all the clear baits. And so that's easy peasy. Again, I can get in the box. I can pick up really hot color, pure black, pure white, or very hot color very easily. So that's the next thing I'll do. I didn't mention it, but it's kind of intuitive. When you scale the size of the bait up, we scale the line up. And biggest reason is controllability of the bait and because I can. Any, I mean, obviously, the heavier the fishing light I can get away with, the easier I can be on fish, the less chance I'm going to break stuff off on snags, the, uh, the more controllable my baits tend to be. So I'll scale the line with the bait. So, you know, if I was throwing that that normally let's say I'm throwing a two and a half inch, you know, power tube with an eight ounce jig head in it in, in the clear water scenario. Well, in the muddy water scenario, maybe I'm throwing a three and a half or even bigger tube jig and it's going to be an extremely bright color uh, instead of my very natural colors that I would find in the clear water. So I'll scale everything up as far as that goes too. Uh, along the same lines, I will fish very tight to cover in muddy water. Fish will tend to be very, very tight to things in muddy water. And I'm not sure I can tell you why that is, but they'll get very close to stuff in muddy water. So I'll fish really close to stuff, which means I need my boat to be closer uh, so that I can... Uh, you know, be very, very accurate and in control. Another thing is I'll tend to fish shallower in muddy water because as that light penetration goes away, fish will move up in the water column, particularly in spring because the surface water tends to be warmer. So 
you can get fish higher in the water comp. So I'll fish shallower uh, around muddy water scenarios as well. Uh, and that, that will a lot of times be, be a good call. But shallow, like for instance, for largemouth uh, or pike, shallow wood cover is very hard to beat or shallow rock cover in, in a very muddy water scenario. Whereas in clear water, that wood cover might be good, but they might be out in much deeper wood cover or something like that. So, uh, or they might not be on wood cover at all because with the clear water, they might just move out and suspend. So it's, that's a key thing, but it really I take the two fundamentals, uh, of the bigger, you know, if in doubt, in clear water downsize if in doubt in muddy water upsize uh both your lure and your line in clear water if in doubt go very shiny or very clear in muddy water go black white or very bright uh in clear water go very fast and very erratic in muddy water go slow and rhythmic uh and so if you just look at it like that going back and forth as you make your decisions uh, it makes things very easy. And of course, anywhere in between there, watercolors wise, uh, and let's talk about what that might be. I'm going to consider muddy water with say 18 inches or less visibility. And in some cases, six inches or less visibility, meaning that if I lower my lure into the water, by the time it's a foot under the surface, I can no longer see it. That's what I consider 12 inches of visibility. And I have consistently caught fish where literally as soon as the bait's under the surface, it's gone. And I've also caught fish where I can literally watch my tube jig on the bottom if it's a bright color, uh, 15 feet down. And we're talking about a little, you know, two and a half inch tube jig. And again, I wouldn't be fishing in a bright color. I'm just saying if the visibility is such that I could see a tube jig on the bottom 15 feet down if it had a little contrast to it. So those are the scenarios I'm looking at. If I can see more than about five feet with good visibility, five or six feet, I'm going to consider it very clear. If I can see less than about 18 inches, I'm going to consider it very dirty. Everything in between there is where things can get a little bit trickier because now I have all of my lure choices available to, to, available to me size-wise, color-wise. I have all my retrieves available to me, uh, You know, maybe fast, maybe slow, maybe erratic, maybe rhythmic. But in a mid mid water stain scenario, I don't have a hard rule one way or the other that's going to tell me. So I, I have to again more stuff to work out. So in some ways, crystal clear water or very muddy water are easier for the angler to work out uh, than the other way around. So, any rate, the biggest thing is back to how I started this whole thing: confidence. Your confidence is going to dictate how many fish you catch or you don't, and. It doesn't matter if you're if you're not confident. It doesn't matter how good your, your retrieves and your lures and all that stuff are. It's going to hurt you. So you just have to go into it with the mindset that these guidelines I just gave you for fishing those scenarios are going to put you in the ballpark and put the trolling motor down and fish. And that's really what it's going to come down to is fish fish with an open mind and be thorough. And you'll catch plenty of fish regardless of the water color. So I appreciate you joining us on this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast. If you'd like to join the conversation on our social media at Fishful Thinker, Facebook, Instagram, uh, also TikTok, and especially on the YouTube channel, we're, we're doing a couple or three videos a week, adding those there. And we would love to have you check those out. I think we're up to about 550 or 580 videos on that channel. So check that out. And, and obviously we hope you'll see what we're up to on World Fishing Network and Altitude Sports Entertainment, what we're bringing you on TV this week. So thanks for tuning in. This has been Fishful Thinker, the podcast. <laughs>